Okay, so now that we've finished everything related to streams and some stuff about using parallel streams, we're going to talk about another feature in the concurrency toolkit of Java 8 called Completable Futures. Once we're done with this section, which will probably be by next week, we'll circle back again and I'll talk about some of the internals of streams in a bit more detail just so you know how they work under the hood because it's kind of cool to know that. But I want to get on with the user programmable features first. So we're going to talk here about how to motivate the need for Java futures. What is a future and why do you need a future? So if you think about everything we've covered so far, all the operations that we've shown in the context of streams and parallel streams have all been synchronous. So what does that mean? That means that the thread that invokes an operation is the same one to carry it out. Another way to say that is that the, the behaviors we've been calling or that we've been passing into the streams framework to call on our behalf, those all borrow the thread of control of the caller until the computations are done. So you can kind of see here, it's sort of a call and response like model. You make a call, you wait, you get a result. Then you make another call, you wait, you get a result, and so on and so forth. There are pros and cons to this form of synchronous communication. So the good part is that this should be very intuitive because you've all been programming with two-way method calls since probably day one, right? When you first learned to program, if you learned Java or Python or C++ or whatever you started out with, uh, and even after the first couple things, you probably learned sequential uh, um, synchronized programming. Everything you did in 101 would probably have been that way. Everything you did in 201 is probably that way. Probably everything you did in 251 is like that, and so on and so forth. So this is all very straightforward. You make a call, you get a result. However, this is not always the best thing to do. And there's a number of reasons for this. In the context of this course, we're interested in performance. And it turns out that synchronous two-way calls don't always give you the most effective utilization of available parallelism on your system. There are situations where you're leaving cores underutilized, which is maybe a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing, but if you're trying to be maximally performant, it's a bad thing. So why is this? Why does this occur? Well, one reason is that anytime you make a call that blocks, like let's say you're waiting to, do, to download a file or you're waiting to, to do some long running thing, like waiting for a lock or whatnot, that ends up incurring overhead that you may not want to or need to incur. So whenever you do a blocking thread, it typically does what's called a context switch, where you go from having that thread run to parking that thread, waiting for whatever it's blocked on to complete, like a lock or an I.O. operation. So there's context switching overhead. You have to move from one thread to another. That takes a fair amount of time. There's synchronization. You have to acquire locks. There's data movement. If you read an operation in one thread and then you pass it to another thread in order to process what you've read, there's overhead there. So moving data around, memory management, there's a whole bunch of things that occur whenever you block stuff, and that can be problematic. Another problem you have is that selecting the right number of threads can be hard. So how many threads should you have? Should you have a lot of threads, which might make things run faster, but maybe uses a lot of resources, a lot of virtual memory, for example, or processing cycles? Um, what's the right choice? So as a general rule of thumb, having more threads will often make things run faster, typically, um, but you end up using more resources because you have to utilize typically more memory and you have bigger tables of threads to keep track of by the operating system so that just the overhead goes up a bit. Conversely, having fewer threads might use resources more effectively. You may not have as much stuff that's being used, but you might underutilize the processor cores because maybe something could run, but there's no threads to run it. So this is a tricky thing, and it's especially hard when you've got I.O.-bound programs. An I.O.-bound program is a program that spends a lot of its time waiting for I.O. So anything that talks to a file or downloads things from the internet, those are often, quote, I.O.-bound. And in an I.O. bound system, if a thread is blocked, then if you don't have a lot of other threads, you could run out of threads. And even though there's work to be done, all your threads are blocked, waiting for stuff to finish, and therefore nothing is making any progress. So that becomes a problem. So trying to figure out how many threads you need is 
hard, and it was particularly hard with I.O. bound programs. Another problem is if you'd make all these synchronous calls, you might need to dynamically change the size of the common fork join pool. Now, this is something that's very specific to parallel streams in Java, but the bottom line is that in Java parallel streams, as you've seen, it tries, for the most part, to use a single common pool. And we'll talk later about why it does that. But for the time being, it's doing that. You can think of it doing that as a way to be able to try to maximize utilization of a common pool of threads, which is, is good. But if you don't get the size of the threads right, you may have to change the size of the pool, either make it bigger or smaller. And that is tedious and error prone to do. So what's an alternative approach? Well, an alternative approach is to use asynchronous or async calls and something called Java futures. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. The basic idea here is that you make a call and the caller calls the callee and the callee returns a thing called a future right away. It doesn't, doesn't block at all. And so you get a future right away. And then the callee somehow, magically, we'll talk about how the magic works in a minute, continues to run in the background. But the caller is not blocked waiting for the call to complete. It's doing something else in the meantime. So the, the async callee returns a future, and it continues running the process or doing the computation in the background. And the caller can do something else in the meantime, like make more async calls, if nothing else. What you get back is this thing called a future. And a future is basically a, a proxy. It's a stand-in for something else. It's a surrogate. And it's used to represent the result of an async computation. And you'll see I always draw this thing as a little table tent. And we've talked about this before. And the reason I do that is because I like to think about futures in the context of a fast food restaurant operations. And, and my favorite go-to example, which I've probably mentioned before, but I'll say it again because it's a good one to remember, is uh, McDonald's versus Wendy's. So if you go to most McDonald's, at least classically when you went to McDonald's and you ordered your Big Mac and fries and a Coke or whatever, the way that they organize McDonald's is they often pre-cook a lot of the food. So they'll have the hamburgers pre-cooked, they'll have the French fries pre-cooked, they'll have the Cokes pre-filled. And when you order your, your meal, you go to the counter, you order your meal, and there's a synchronous transaction where you say, I'd like a Big Mac, fries, and a large Coke or whatever. And they say, okay, great. You know, they take your money, they, they turn back to the heat lamp where everything's cached. They grab your food, they give it back to you, and away you go, right? So it's, it's a synchronous transaction, classically. So that's good because they can get a lot of throughput by caching, right? They're caching the results and handing them back to you. But the downside is your, your food isn't really cooked to order. And it's always a problem at McDonald's if you go in and say, I want a hamburger that isn't what you have in your cache. Oh, man, that really throws them for a loop, right? Um, when I was a kid, I always wanted plain hamburgers. I didn't, didn't want ketchup, didn't want mustard. And it would always take like twice as long to get anything at McDonald's because it wasn't what they had made. There are other restaurants like Wendy's that differentiate themselves from McDonald's by cooking your food to order. So you go in and you order a, a Wendy's burger or whatever they're called. And um, rather than you standing there and them just grabbing it out of the heat lamp, they will take your money and give you back something that looks kind of like this, right? The table tent. So it's a piece of plastic with a number on it. And that's a future. And the idea there is that that way they can cook your food to order, but you don't have to stand there blocking at the line, the, the cashier line, and slowing down the transactions, right? Because if everybody had to wait, it would take forever, and you'd get impatient, and your food would be delayed, and the customers wouldn't flock to Wendy's, and it would, they would lose more money per hour, right? So instead, they, they cook the food in the kitchen, and then somehow you get the food once it's done. And there's a couple different ways to do this. One way is for you to periodically walk back up to the pickup window, and show them the little plastic table tent number thing and say, is, is order number 12 ready yet? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, they give it to you. If the answer is no, you can either wait at the, the pickup window or go back to your table and play on your phone or pour yourself a drink or read the paper or whatever you're doing, right? Another way to do it is to have them come out and call you back, right? So someone will come out and say, 
Where's order number 12, right? They deliver it to you. So that's what we call a callback model. And when the, the model where you go up and you periodically check with them to see if the food is ready, that's called the polling model. And you can poll either by just sitting there, you know, just standing there waiting, or you could check every so often. So that's kind of a blocking versus timed model. So there's a couple different ways you can pick up your food in a Wendy's environment once they give you a future. So when the computation finally finishes, the future is triggered or completed, and then the caller can pick up the result. Again, based on either polling or callback. Uh, in, as we'll see in Java, they use a simple polling or timed polling model with the classic simple futures. And the way you do this is there's a method called get. And get is defined on a future, and it'll return a result. You can either wait on it, or you can pull it, or you can do a timed bounded blocking call. So these are the ways you can get the results via a future in classic Java. And one of the things to remember here is that the results can occur, you can get the results back in a different order than the calls were originally made. Same thing is true at Wendy's. If you go to Wendy's and you order some really complicated meal, and you're first in line, and then someone else comes up and they order a very simple thing, they may actually get their order faster than you, even though you were there first. Whereas that would never happen in the, sort of the classic McDonald's model, right? Whoever shows up first in line and who stands there blocking, waiting to get the results back, they're going to be served before somebody else, even if the other person's ordering something very simple. Uh, you can definitely feel this if you ever go through a drive through If you go through the drive through at uh, a fast food restaurant, Wendy's included, then typically it's first in, first out, right? It's FIFO scheduling, and no matter what the order of the person ahead of you is, whether it be large or small relative to yours, you just wait for them to be done. Um, by the way, has anybody ever noticed how many restaurants try to speed up processing with the drive-through? Right, so they can't really do the asynchronous approach with the drive-through as easily, unless you go to Sonic or something like that. How does, um, how do most, how, how do many restaurants try to speed up processing at a drive-through? Right, or, or sometimes even three windows. So sometimes you'll have a window where you make the order. Usually it's not a window, it's usually like a, a sign with a speaker with, with a menu on it. So you place your order, and then you drive through, and then you might pay for your order, and then you drive through, and then you might pick up your order. Right, so what's, what's that a classic example of from a workflow point of view? What do we call that? When you, when you have, Caleb, yeah, pipeline, exactly, right. So it's a pipeline of, of cars moving through and each one is serviced. You know, it's kind of like going through a cafeteria, if you ever had a cafeteria at one of your schools or whatnot, uh, where you go through and there's a long, you know, line of food and you can sit there and get something and you get like, meat from one of the stations and vegetables from one of the stations and dessert from one of the stations and drink from one of the stations. And the idea is just to have like a pipeline of people moving through the line. Okay, so that's basically the end of the classic form of Java futures.